Hello and welcome to Tips from Teachers Making the Most of Your Instructional Time video on Digital AP Testing. I'm Bill from AP, and I'm so glad you're here. In January 2024, we announced that nine AP subjects will move to digital-only exam administrations starting in May 2025. Following the announcement, AP teachers and those subjects have reached out to ask us if we could connect them with other AP teachers with experience in digital AP testing who would be willing to share their approaches and strategies and to offer ideas on the tools that work best for them and their students. This video will do just that. This video is a recording of a webinar that took place in September 2023 titled, Refining Your Teaching Strategies for Digital AP Exams. The webinar was conceived by an experienced AP English Lit teacher, Melissa Smith, and includes advice and in tips on how she prepared her students to take a digital AP exam. Feel free to take a screenshot or snap a picture of the slides with her tips and strategies. Just know that the tips are meant to prompt ideas and they're shared in the spirit of teacher collaboration. By no means do we expect AP teachers to implement every tip that is shared. Take what you want and use what you think will work best for you and your students. Again, thanks for joining. Hi everyone, welcome to our Teaching Strategies for Digital Exam webinar. I'm Melissa Smith, I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I'm an AP teacher at Lake Norman Charter High School. I'm so happy to be with you today and thank you everyone for coming. Joining me is Bill from the AP program. Hey Bill. Hey, hello Miss Lissa and hello everyone. Yeah, this is Bill Lankenau and I'm joining you today from the wonderful Commonwealth of Virginia in a little suburb just outside of the capital Richmond called Midlothian. So, so glad to be here with you today too. Bill and I are partnering to bring you this webinar. As the title hopefully conveys, it is for AP teachers and is going to be full of instructional practices, ideas for students taking the digital AP exam. Bill and I shared the same presentation back in July at the AP annual conference, and we thought it'd be a really great webinar to share with anyone who's interested. So here we are. Let's begin with a quick overview of what we're going to cover in the webinar. First of all, we'll do an overview of the digital AP exams. Then we'll talk a little bit about some strategies to be successful on the multiple choice section, as well as the free response section, and also some strategies you can use in your classrooms to help prepare students for the digital exam. Super quick, it's a little bit about myself. I'm in my 19th year teaching, 15 years of that have been AP. I'm co-author to a couple of books, and I'm also an AP consultant and AP reader. Bill, would you mind going over these digital exam AP testing, please? Yes, let's talk some facts and figures from last school year, the second year of Proctor digital AP exams. Now, some of you joining the webinar, you may not realize that in 2023, schools located in the 48 contiguous states and the District of Columbia, those schools had the option to administer seven AP exams in a digital mode. And you see those seven subjects right here the two AP English exams, English Lit and English Lang, the three AP History exams, US History, European History, World History, AP Seminar, and AP Computer Science Principles. So the key word you see on that slide though is option. So eligible schools could choose to administer one or more exams in a digital or administer on paper. So you might be asking yourself, so how did it go last year? So in May, 2023, over 3,600 schools decided to administer a digital AP exam in one of those seven subjects, and a total of 320,000 exams across those seven subjects were administered digitally. In fact, over 20% of the total exam volume of AP Computer Science principles and AP Seminar were administered digitally. And as you can see here, students took over 90,000 AP English Lang and 64,000 AP US History exams. And these administrations at individual schools, they range from less than 10 students to over 700. And in case you're wondering, yes, all of these exams were scored and were included in the scores students received and the instructional planning reports teachers received released in July. Okay, so for this upcoming year, 
The digital option is available in those same seven subjects that had a digital option last year. And this year, like last year, eligibility is limited to those 48 states in the Washington, D.C. But let's talk specifically about AP African American Studies. So schools approved to participate in this pilot course, they'll administer an operational AP exam and students taking the exam will of course receive an official AP score that will be reported to colleges and universities. But I wanna make an important note here. And the reason I bring this up in this webinar is that the AP African American Studies exam is digital format only. So paper exams will not be an option for that exam. And then finally, we're going to continue to understand and listen to feedback we've received from schools and districts to improve the availability of digital and the experience of digital for students across multiple subjects this year's and future years. So though, to learn more about digital AP testing, please go to cb.org slash AP-2024 dash digital. Okay, so now I'd just like to go quickly into the format of these digital AP exams. I'm sure a lot of teachers joining us interested in that. So first of all, these exams are full length AP exams. So for exams with both multiple choice and free response, the digital exam will contain both. And the exam themselves, it's, they're going to assess the same required course content and skills and in the same format as the paper exams. So please consult the course and exam description on AP Central for course specific content, skills, and format. And when I say the same, I'm referring to the same number of sections, the same number of questions within a section, the same number of questions, the same number of question choices, and the same time limits. And here's one I know is of great interest. These proctored digital exams, they will allow students to go back within a section or a part to review previous questions. So again, students will be able to go back within a section or part, just like they can in a paper exam. Now, I also know that many AP teachers, they teach skills that rely on tools. So I have some good news here. The testing app that students use for digital exams is called Blue Book. And Blue Book includes a variety of tools that students will use. And I'll go over those in just a few minutes. But last, student scores will be reported and FRQs released at the same time as corresponding paper exams, just like they were last year. So Melissa, I've probably been talking enough. I bet many teachers joining us today would really be interested in your reasons for going digital. What was important for you and your students? First of all, thank you for sharing all that, Bill. Um, for me, there's a lot of different reasons why I prefer the digital exam, um, as well as my students. It's easier uh, as far as administration goes. Your AP uh, coordinator will love you um, because it's just a, the click of a button, right? There's no papers to mess with. There's no bubbles to mess with. So your students are not going to miss bubble and then have to erase a bunch or accidentally skip a bubble or any of the bubbling. Um, it's it's super streamlined. Everything is taken care of you. Just all thank you, technology. Um, again, to reiterate what Bill was saying, it's the same. Everything is the same. So there's really no reason uh, not to do digital. And my personal favorite, why I choose digital, um, of course, with all those that I just mentioned, but I get to read typed essays all year. Um, student handwriting is, uh, yeah, it's a thing. And so the fact that I can collect essays all year that are beautifully typed, and I can also offer digital feedback um, is just the best. Um, and again, of course, my students prefer it too, which I'll share some um, student testimonies later in our webinar. So let's talk about multiple choice and go through a little overview here. So the exam format, um, here I have as examples, the English exams um, that are very, very similar, right? So we have our one hour multiple choice section that has 55 for lit and 45 for Lang, and then there's the break in between, and then they do their um, free response section after that, two hours plus the reading time for Lang. So that's going to be the same on both the paper and digital AP exams. On the 
paper exam, students will see, you know, the passage with multiple questions on one page, but the digital exam will have just one at a time. And Bill, yeah. would you actually mind yeah, popping you in for a second? This? Yeah, 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 yeah. If you can follow along, because I think you're going to have to hit the button to uh, highlight okay. this. So so here's like, I, I promise a bunch of features in um, the system that I would share. So this is um, what you'll see. I think this is an examples from English um, Lit a multiple choice question in English Lit. So I'm gonna show you all the cool features in Blue Book. So as Melissa mentioned, like the question passage, it's in the left pane. You can see that with the number one there. And then if you go to the next one, Melissa, the question stem and the answer choices, they're over in the right-hand pane. So that format is pretty consistent across all the exams. Then you'll see a timer at the top. It's a little, maybe hard to see, but that timer counts down. So when you start the multiple choice questions in English Lit, it's gonna start at 60 minutes and it's gonna count all the way down to zero. When it gets, I think the last five minutes, it turns red. And students can see that or they can hide it if that bothers them. Then in, in the text in the passage, you'll see like, so this question refers to a specific passage in the question. It's highlighted and underlined in the passage itself. So students might mention they really like that feature. Mm -hmm. Then navigation. So you can this is you can see that we're we're not on the first question. We're somewhere in the middle. So you can see we can go to the next and the back button. Remember, I said the back button's there. There it is. But also there's, there's like a question menu that allows you to jump around. So you don't have to go back and forth through that. Then you can annotate. Now, I know you're going to talk about this, Melissa. You can annotate. You can highlight um, text in the passage and you can add a note through the, you know, the system. You can mark a question for, so if a student says like, I don't know, I wanna move on, you can mark it for review so you can go back to it later. It has a question, or a, sorry, an answer choice eliminator so you can cross off answers you know are wrong. And then finally, you just select the correct answer and you can see there it's highlighted um, in blue. So that's how you student would say that's the correct answer. Mm -hmm. So a lot of features there in the multiple choice experience. Yes, thank you. Um, as students are working their way through the multiple choice section, the questions that they are getting for each passage will generally go chronologically in order um, through the passage from beginning to end. The complexity, however, of the questions or the perceived complexity, I should say, um, are mixed, right? So you'll get a hard one, an easy one, a medium one, all mixed around. Um, each question is worth one point, regardless if it is a question that the student thinks is really easy or really hard. And so those really hard ones, they can flag it and come back later. So when students are answering multiple choice questions, these are some strategies I help, uh, I, I teach them to help them analyze the text that they are about to answer questions on. Again, I said this earlier on the paper exam, a student will see multiple questions on one individual page, which I know for some of my students that felt a little overwhelming for them. On the digital exam, they only see one question at a time. And whatever, if the, if the question is referring to a phrase or line of the passage, that will be highlighted already for the students. So their eyes don't have to scan and find the phrase that the question is asking about. My students loved that feature. Um, on paper exam, students can underline, annotate, take notes in the margins, and really same thing with the digital exam. They can do all the same things, but on digital, they do have a highlighter option um, as well as underlining and the annotation tool. If they click on it, a little notes box opens up and they type whatever note they wanna make in there, their annotation. And then they'll have a little marker there on the text that shows that they made an annotation there. So if they just drag their mouse over it, again, they'll see that note that they had made previously. It doesn't just disappear. So. When they're answering questions, um, I do suggest to my students to use the Eliminator cross-off tool, right? This is just gonna help you just forget that one. You know it's wrong, so cross it off. Um, of course, these are all my tips that I use in my own classroom, um, just like as a AP Lit teacher. Um, so the lines in the passage, um, if they are referring to, uh, being referred to in the question, you know, it says in line 14, what does this refer to? Um, that'll be highlighted for them. And I also 
suggests that they read three lines above and three lines below, because oftentimes that context around the phrase that the question is asking about will provide illumination to what the answer is. So always read a little bit before and a little bit after. And if you just don't know, mark it and save it for later. Um, and there's a, a little menu at the bottom of their screen it's very easy. They just hover over it and it shows them which questions they have marked and need to go back to. And they can just click it and it sends them right back to that question. So there's no like shuffling through papers last minute. Oh, did I answer all the questions? Um, it's it's so easy just for them to see visually what they still need to do. Ah, here's what I was just talking about right there. So as you can see on the bottom of the screen there, um, the student has a couple marked. He has one he hasn't answered yet. Um, so they can just click that and go right to that question. The timer is really nice because I know in my school, half of our clocks don't work. Um, the proctor, you know, I think they're supposed to give them a so many minute warning at the end if they're doing the paper exam. Sometimes that happens. Hmm. So nice about the timer is that it's very clear, right? How many, how much time students have left. Um, and they could choose to hide it if it makes them anxious. Some of my students chose to do that. But regardless, if they have it open or if they choose to hide it, it will pop up when they have five minutes remaining and it will turn red uh, just to indicate to them, hmm, time to get finished. One thing when students are answering multiple choice questions, and this is the, the word distractor is a word that I think I've heard in the AP uh, community amongst teachers, right? Um, and so it's this one of the answer choices that is it seems so right and you want to pick it, but there's something about it that makes it incorrect. And so I try to, you know, make my students aware of possible uh, perceived distractors in the answer choices. So something's going to be iffy with the answer that makes it not the best option. For example, it might not be consistent with the rest of the passage in some way or form. It might be too broad or too narrow. And I think the one that I most commonly see or that my students maybe struggle with the most is that it's like a two-part answer. And one of the parts of the answer is so perfect. It would be like exactly what you would want to answer, but that other half of the answer is incorrect, therefore making the entire answer incorrect and they can't choose it. Um, but that that one that seems so right, they like they really want to choose it. Uh, and so we we practice looking at those and okay, well, why why is this answer actually incorrect? So some of it might be true, but not all of it is true. More tips. Answers will not contradict each other. So this is what I love about the going back feature that if they answer a question, you know, that they were unsure of, and then three questions later, they get a, a similar kind of question. They're like, oh, oh, and the, the question makes them understand something better. And then they realize, you know, they got to go back to that one that they were unsure of because now they are more sure of it. So it's really nice um, that the 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 answers are not going to contradict each other. The tone is what the tone is. The, the topic is what the topic is. Um, and that's going to remain consistent between all of the questions. And of course, we want to make sure we're practicing multiple choice throughout the year um, in, in low stakes ways. And we just get our students comfortable and confident with answering multiple choice questions. So I'm going to move on to the free response questions or the written portion of the exam. So for the AP English exams, it's two hours that they get plus 15 minutes for laying for the reading time to go through all that materials and the synthesis essay, all those sources students have to work through. Um, no reading time on lit, but two hours to write all their essays. Bill. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Back. Let's talk features now for free response. So this really applies to the free response questions in the English exams, but also just as well to like the history exams, you know, for wherever students are typing in their essays. So what you'll see here is, again, the passage or excerpt is in the left pane, typically. And then the prompt and a text box for students to enter their constructed response to the prompt, that's over in the right pane. So left, left and right. And once again, there'll be a timer. So right after the break, Students will begin section two and the timer will start counting down. So here I have two examples with English, with AP Lit and keep me honest here, uh, Melissa, 120 minutes and 135 minutes for AP Lang. 
So it'll count down. So whatever the timing for the section, it'll start off there and start counting down. And again, the students can hide that timer if that bothers them. And so once again, like the like in the multiple choice, they can navigate back and forth using the, the next and, and um, previous buttons. They, they have that question menu to jump around if they want. And yes, it's really important when they jump around, whatever they typed previously is saved. So they can like partially answer a question and jump to another one and come back. The yes, 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 it's all saved as they go along. So they can also use that um, annotate feature so they can highlight text like you saw earlier or, or and they can add a note to the highlighted text. Much like we saw before, they can mark a question for later review. And there's like simple tools in there for bolding, cut, paste, um, italicize, indenting, bulleted list, that sort of thing, rich text editor to format. Now they, they won't be able to cut and paste text from the passage, but they can cut and paste the text that they enter, okay? Let's just make that super clear. Yes. All right, so that's the features. Now let's, Melissa, let's uh, find out how you apply these great features or how your students do. I, I will. I actually want to add on a couple of things that I think are important for teachers to know. So your students will be allowed to have a scrap sheet of paper. Um, for my students, that is important. They can outline, draft a thesis, whatever they want to do on that scrap sheet of paper. Um, and then also in the text box where they're going to type their essay, I had some students use the bullet features to draft their little outline um, first and then kind of filling in the essay around that and eventually deleting the bullet points. Um, but some students worked that way. And also another thing I want to say is that the exam automatically submits when the timer goes to zero. So there's no submit button. Uh, it just, when that timer is done, zero minutes, zero seconds, the exam automatically submits itself. So that's really nice because there's, you know, no uh, mistakes being made of, oh, I didn't hit submit. Okay, some strategies I share with my students when they're taking uh, the, the writing portion of the exam is that they should check out all of the prompts beforehand to see which one they feel the best starting with, right? Because they can answer them in any order. Uh, they can go back and forth between the three essay questions or however many written responses your, your exam has. Uh, and if they do get started on one and decide, mm, I want, I would rather pop over here for a minute, their work is saved, as Bill had just mentioned. That timer is so nice there. You know, it just, it it's uh, fail safe. They're not craning around to see the clock in the back wall of the classroom. What's so nice, too, about the digital exam, y'all, is that they can delete just delete and and retype whatever it is they wanted. There's no crossouts um, like we see with the paper exam. Not that that matters, right? AP readers don't pay attention to crossouts. It, it doesn't affect their score at all. But what it does affect is your student's confidence. And I've had some students um, say in their feedback to me that they felt more confident in that their writing looked more controlled because they were able to just delete. Um, and yes, they get to type. And so many students. Maybe not all, but so many can type faster than they can write. So some strategies for analyzing their passages. First of all, read the prompt several times, right? And you can make uh, little annotations on the prompt, make yourself some notes. You can highlight the different tasks that the prompt is asking you to do. Uh, you can, you know, make sure you remember exactly what it is the prompt is asking. AP, answer the prompt, right? I know this should be just obvious, but please read the entire passage <laughs> and any footnotes, right? And the title, how many times does the title often provide us such great information to help us understand the passage and footnotes as well? You know, they're there for a reason. And College Board felt like this was an important tidbit of information to help the students understand this passage. Um, so footnotes, titles, anything extra on the page, absolutely read. They can annotate the passage itself and make notes, highlight, underline, um, and those will all be saved if they move to a different uh, essay question and they come back. Those will all still be there. 
And when they're actually going to write, right? Oh, those are my students from last year. Hi, they've all since graduated. Um, and the pictures that you're seeing throughout the webinar are all my AP Lit students from last year. I had 80 students last year. Um, they did tremendously on the exam. I had a 97% rate. This year I have 100 students. So being able to read typed essays all year is really, really nice. Okay, sorry, I digress. So strategies for writing essays. Some do's and do nots uh, that I use in my classroom as tips for my students is thesis statements are really important. And yes, I mean, we we joke that they're low hanging fruit, right, in the, in the AP reader community, but still it sets you up for success. It sets you up with a line of reasoning and a really strong thesis is going to help you earn more points, hopefully in the other rows of the rubric as well. So getting a really nice thesis statement out uh, is one of the most important things, in my opinion, to do on an essay. I do also think it is extremely important that students just don't start typing, but they actually take a couple minutes to outline some thoughts and to get some ideas organized before they write. It's going to help them to not veer off on tangents and waste precious time. It's going to help them have a roadmap to follow as they write their essay. It's going to help their essay be more cohesive and, well, lots of other things too, I'm sure. They're going to include specific keyword, right, if they want to earn the most points um, in that textual evidence and commentary row of the rubric, row B, they must include multiple instances of specific textual evidence and the good commentary paired along with that. I like to use the phrase quote sprinkles when they're pulling little phrases from the text to integrate uh, and embed those quotes into their own papers. They should have right, multiple little quote sprinkles per paragraph. Use paragraphs, one solid block of text. I don't think it's gonna affect their score per se, but it's, it's just cleaner, it's more logically organized when we can see those paragraphs. Quickly proofread, right? I'm sure there's some little mistakes that you might make that you can easily correct by just a quick little proofread. Some things that you can kind of just skip because they're not really that important is spending a long time on a lengthy introduction or conclusion. There's no place on the rubric that says that a student needs that. And really the bulk of it is their body, right? So they, that's where they should spend the most time. We don't need any summary or paraphrase of the text. Uh, we're looking for their insights, interpretations, and analysis of the text encourage them to go back and look at the prompt every so often and just make sure that what they are writing is actually answering the prompt and don't leave an essay blank. It's so easy just to get even two points for two sentences. If they write a thesis and one or two more sentences that are just about the text, two sentences, you get two points, a one, one, zero, right? And that's so much better than leaving an essay blank and getting a zero. All right. So in my classroom, I use this thesis statement template with my students. They use this actually for all three of my essays, the poetry analysis, the prose analysis, and the free response uh, literary argument question. So I like for them to start their thesis, which is the author in the title, right? So in Franz Kafka's Metamorphosis. And that kind of clues the AP reader that, okay, my thesis is coming, but it also helps the student in getting that thesis statement started, right? They, they have a very easy start, right? Everyone can write that. So the middle of the thesis is where they're gonna answer the prompt. So whatever the prompt is asking about, let's see, there was a, an exam prompt a few years ago about a character who has a gift, right? So in the middle of my thesis, I need to identify which character I'm gonna talk about uh, and what that gift is. So Werner in All the Light We Cannot See's gift with um, radio technology, okay? And then we're going to connect that to a thematic idea from the work, right? And so this is going to help us build our line of reasoning, and we, we can keep connecting back to this thematic idea in the work in each body paragraph and really creating a nice streamlined line of reasoning throughout our essay. And we want to make sure that that thematic statement is written as a complete statement, not a theme seed. Um, this is what I just teach my students in class and they use this template um, and it is successful and they earn their thesis statement point and sets them up really nicely to write their essay. 
I'm not going to go through this in detail like I just did the thesis statement, but I did just want to share really quickly how I show my students to perhaps go about outlining their essay, right? So they can do this as quick bullet points on their scrap sheet of paper or in the essay text box. Um, but I, I tell them to pick three scenes or or three uh ideas that they have about the passage, if it's uh, poetry or prose. Um, and then that kind of becomes a controlling scene or example for each of the body paragraphs, um, including specific evidence is so important, tying that with the commentary. And if we're talking about the, um, actually all three essays, tying back to that thematic idea of the passage or of the work that they're choosing um, for their literary argument essay. Again, you got to practice in class, right? Students should be familiar with these essays uh, and have written them and practice with them multiple times um, for all the different types of writing that they'll see on their exams. Of course, reviewing those big ideas from your um, AP uh, course and exam description. So those are fresh in their heads entering into the exam. Practice reading in class together, right, and analyzing together and discussing these texts and, and the insights and interpretations that they have. And along with that, too, is to remember, you know, to encourage your students to take risks and to form their own interpretations, because there's really no wrong answer if it is an interpretation that they are having about the text. If they're talking about something completely different, like, you know, what they had for dinner last night, okay, fine, that is off task. But there's no wrong answers if they have an idea about the text. And, and as an AP reader, um, I can confidently say to encourage your students not to be afraid of having the wrong answer because um, there's no such thing. Depth, not breadth. Uh, AP, my AP classroom is not about flying through all the things, right? We slow down, take the time to really get into and discuss the nuances and complexities of the text. It's not a race to see how much we can all teach in our classrooms. It's about your students having a deep and enduring understanding of the text that they're reading to then show their knowledge on the exam. And of course, reviewing with sample questions, multiple choice, and the free response questions as well. So I said that I would share some of my student testimonies. Um, hi, students. So in their junior year, they had taken AP Lang and they took the paper exam for their AP Lang exam. I had them their senior year and they took the digital AP Lit exam. So this crew of kids right here had both experiences. They had paper and digital and so many of them chose digital as their preferred option. And some of my students just loved the typing aspect. Some of them loved that they could um, just click on the ones that they were missing. They loved the uh, how when they were on the question, it would highlight the part in the passage that that question was talking about. And that made it so much easier for them, just their eyes to go immediately there. Uh, they felt more confident because they could type faster and neater. Um, some of these kids' handwriting is really mm, special. So being able to type just made them feel better. Uh, they liked they didn't have to bubble. They liked it was just a simple, quick click, let's get started and done, right? There was no long proctor introductions and passing out of booklets and all that stuff. Um, Jade here, she's um, the one with the pearl necklace. She just so much better, right? Everything was so easy. And you still get a scrap sheet of paper because that is an important little bit, I think, that um, really for me as a teacher just helps me feel so much better. If if you're nervous about, for whatever reason, you know, transitioning for digital, they still get that scrap sheet. They can still jot down notes and draft things and, you know, draw or whatever sketch note they want to do on that scrap sheet of paper and being able to annotate and highlight and the timer being so helpful. Justin says he felt less stressed, right? That's awesome because he could delete his mistakes. They weren't glaring on his page. Eliminator tool they really like, the bookmarking tool, user-friendly, right? Everything's uh, just very easy to navigate, honestly. Um, and there's the blue book. 
right? Which we'll talk about later where students can see exactly what they're going to experience on the exam. It's impossible to miss one or leave one blank because that little menu down at the bottom of the screen will let you know that you left one blank. And I love that she said, instead of flipping through the book aggressively with 10 seconds left. And that's a very stressful feeling, right? Like flipping through all the pages uh, when it's just right there on the bottom of their screen. And then I thought this was just a really kind of interesting little tidbit is that um, she says she could focus better because the light from the computer was better than staring at a booklet because she lost interest when she looked at the booklet. Hey, whatever works, whatever works. So some of the things I do in my classroom to help my students prepare for the digital exam is I do a lot of digital work in my classroom. And it, we're in a digital age, right? So of course, we're going to do a lot of these things in our classrooms regardless. And we don't even realize sometimes that they are, in fact, preparing our students to take the digital AP exam. So online collaboration, right, using Google Docs and working together on essays. One of my favorite things to do is to assign group essays. And while the essays might not turn out as beautifully as I would love to, that's not the point. The point is the discussions they have as they are writing the group essays. Um, and they could do this on a, a shared Google Doc. Yeah, just walking around and listening to them decide and making those choices in their writing as a group together is really great. Just makes my teacher heart so happy. Using online assessments and quizzes, and of course, AP Classroom would be one of my first places that I would send you. But there's lots of other fun programs that you can use. And I know we, we know a lot of these already, but there's one Socrative or Socrative. I'm not sure how you say it, but I like to use this one. Um, I'm going to give you a quick little thing I do in my classroom with that is so we were just practicing writing thesis statements last week. And I do what I call a thesis statement throwdown. And the students all have the same passage and they all have the same prompt and they write a thesis statement with a partner. Right. So the two of them work together to write a thesis statement. They type their thesis statement into the Socrative, it's called a quiz um, that I've shared with them. And they're all entered, all the thesis statements um, that each pair has written, they're all entered anonymously. And so they show up on the screen, kind of like in a row from top to bottom. And I give them all little whiteboards and we vote. We take the first and the second thesis statement on the board and we say, OK, which one do we like better? One or two? OK, well, why is one better? Oh, it has this, this and that and that. OK, great. And then two, we disappear. And then we go to the next one, one or two. Oh, we like two better now. OK, so then one disappears. We have a new number one. We keep comparing them, you know, this one to that one, this one to that one until there is one final winning thesis statement and that partner wins like an extra credit point or something, but they feel really good about themselves. And that feedback for every single thesis and that repetitive nature of looking at each and every thesis and really nitpicking them to see which one uh, we're voting for, but it's all anonymous, which is extremely important. So nobody feels embarrassed or anything. It's really one of the best activities I think I do when it comes to crafting thesis statements with my students. Thesis statement throwdown. In AP classroom. Uh, I love the data that we can get. So this is uh, my whole class data. And I can see, you know, some of the skills that we're sitting pretty at, and then some skills we probably need to, to work on some more. So next thing that we're reading, right, we could focus uh, more on these skills, or I could choose a work that highlights those ones, uh, those skills more than other skills. And then of course, we can also look at each individual question and be like, oh, y'all did really bad on question number 14 and 17. Let's take a look at those and see uh, why. And then also I noticed the skill for both of those is 3D. So clearly I need to go back to that skill and maybe do a little bit of review with that. You can also look at individual student data, which is great. This was one of my students who I think could maybe use some more practice in skill six with comparison. So what's cool about AP Classroom is you can individually assign questions to students based on the area that they need more work in. One of my big things as an English teacher that made me tentative to transfer over to digital was losing annotations, the colorful highlighting 
and underlining and markering and the the beautiful artwork that their passages become. I would wallpaper my house in student annotations if I could. Um, I just, they make me giddy. I love them so much. And I was, had like a sadness uh, to lose that aspect of my classroom, but I didn't have to because A, we can still do that plenty and B, we can also do that digitally. So there's a free Google um, add-on called Kami. Um, and I use this all the time with my students. I kind of whipped up an example here for you that you can really recreate all that gorgeous, colorful rainbow annotations uh, in a digital nature as well. And while the AP exam only has a yellow highlighter option, getting them the practice of doing that digitally, those annotations is really helpful for them when they go to take the AP exam and they have to do that digitally on the exam. One of my favorite things to do is have my students blog, um, and then we swap blogs with other AP Lit teachers around the country. So my co-author to the Norton Guide to AP Literature, Susan Barber, for example, her students um, write the blogs, and, and my students write the blogs, and then we share the blogs with each other's students, and they comment on each other. And what we do is we do poetry analysis blogs every month. So just find yourself a buddy, an AP Lit teacher buddy, or, or whatever subject you teach. Um, and that could also, you know, be a really cool thing because students see their writing as uh, having an authentic audience. It's low stakes and their peers are commenting on it. And it, oftentimes it's students from different regions of different backgrounds. And it's really cool to see, you know, students doing the same thing in Atlanta, Georgia and Charlotte, North Carolina. And peer editing um, online using, you know, any online tool, Google Docs, you know, comment feature, whatever, but getting them to get into the process of revising their writing online to help them prepare for the digital AP exam. And of course, I, I would be remiss to not practice uh, or preview what the exam is going to look like using the Blue Book app. And this is shared, of course, from College Board and it's a quick little install and your students can go and, and see what their exam's actually going to look like. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Melissa, but there's so many questions on this. Um, oh. I want like everyone stop. No, go back. Stop. Okay. stop. Listen to me. Everybody's like, what does this look like? What does the histories look like? What does CSP look like? What does seminar look like? What is what what what, 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 what does it look like? I can't encourage you enough. To go to bluebookapp.collegeboard.org tonight, if you can, or tomorrow, if you have a personal computer, Windows, Mac, uh, a managed Chromebook, a um, iPad, download the the Blue Book um, app, and then like it, it points out here, log in with your College Board Educator account. You don't have to have a student account. You can log in with an educator account, all right? And then you'll you'll get to a home page. You'll see a test preview card. And then magically, there are uh, seven AP exams there for preview. So I had a lot of questions. Okay, this is fine for English Lit or Lang. What does this you know exam look like? That's the way you can see it. I'm just like that kind of person. I want to like I want to see it and I want to touch and feel it. That's the way you do it. Please, please do that. Uh, I can't encourage you enough to do that um, right away and get and see for yourself. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. But <laughs> no, that's really important because that. there's so many teachers here that are just like, I don't care about AP English <laughs> and they want to see their stuff. And I absolutely get that. Um, but yeah, the Blue Book app is uh, just a quick download and then you can see exactly what your exam is going to look like. Um, and your students can as well. I mean, you could show them in class tomorrow if you wanted to. I usually wait until closer to exam time to have my students preview with the Blue Book app. But yes, definitely a crucial step in getting them prepared for the test. So recap why I and my students prefer the digital exam. Typing essays is a, a real big factor in that once you get familiar with the blue book and what your exam is going to look like, you can feel more confident in sharing that with your students. Um, just take a look at it yourself first. Of course, you could always uh, email with any questions that you have to College Board. You're doing the same thing, uh, just transferring it from paper to digital, like those annotations, for example, um, using Kami instead of on paper. And I still do plenty of stuff on paper in my class too as practice, but also allowing them those opportunities for digital practice. Which brings us to 
Q and A. So, Bill, big timing. Yeah, yeah if you could j- jump over to the Q and A, and um, there was a number of questions, or at least a couple. I think that you'd be a good one to answer about how do you prevent students from using chat GPT and AI when typing their essays? I think I saw a couple of those types of questions. So yes, any thoughts on that, Melissa? Yeah, sure. And this isn't just for AP. This is for all ELA classrooms, right? Um, And it is a struggle, I got to say. So I have Schoology at at my school. That's our LMS system. And it has a lockdown browser on it. So I use that for like in-class essays and uh, they they can't click out of the app, right? And the AP exam is the same way. It locks them in uh, to the AP exam app. So that's my number one thing that I do. I We also uh, pay for Turnitin. So anytime students are submitting anything written uh, that's like substantial, like even their blogs that they write, I have them run it through the Turnitin. And I know that they're not foolproof. It's more preventative, honestly. Uh, they think they work. And so it it really does help prevent students from uh potentially thinking about using GPT chat or whatever. Are some students going to use it regardless? Yes. I also like, I have the discussion with my students, like you guys, you use it. Okay, great. But who, who are you really hurting here? You know, you're going to have to do this on the AP exam. So the more you practice legitly, the more successful you're going to be. So, and, you know, having that little heart to heart conversation too. But yeah, otherwise than that, in-class writing, having them turn their computer screens towards Mm -hmm. you is another big one. And you're sitting behind them and they don't know if you're looking at them or not, which is great because you're they have their backs to you, but all their screens are are facing you. So that's that's just a very easy one uh, as well. That doesn't involve technology. It's just you staring over their shoulder. <laughs> yeah, great. And uh, how about if I take a question? There's a number of questions related to practice and preview. I'll try to talk very slowly here. So inside a blue book, and again, please download that, there's a capability called test preview. And so within each test preview, there's seven test previews. Right now, there isn't one for AP African American Studies, but that's coming shortly. So there's seven test previews, and they're just sample, multiple choice, free response, all, you know, all the question types you would find in the applicable exam. So all the history exams have the DBQ and the short answer. So there's a sampling of what those items will look like in a digital exam, but they're not a full length exam. They're just samples, right? So it's important that you expose that to your students, um, you know, so they're familiar with the interface, but it's not intended to be used for you as a teacher to assign to students and where you're going to grade. It's not a full, it's not what I would call practice. You can't do a practice exam. Continue to use AP Classroom for you know full length practice exams this is the previews are really to give the students a view into what the experience will look like on exam day with the the different types of question types that's what it's really designed for yeah and i'm going to answer a question i see in here that says i know i can't use questions in ap classroom on graded assignments true does this also apply to the questions on blue book so, Bill, correct me if I'm wrong, but mm-hmm. they don't actually answer questions on Blue Book, right? It's just for them to kind of see what it's going to be like. Right. Well, they can select them, but there's no um, answer key. You know, there's no like, oh, you got 10 right and three wrong, right? There's So it's it's just there for you to experience, you know, for students to experience and for you to experience. This is what an exam will look like. That's what preview is designed for. Yes. So there's a couple of questions about that, actually. So just to reiterate, the Blue Book app is not for classroom practice, but just to preview what the exam looks like. Right. Right. And use the tool. So on exam day, here's how annotate is going to work. Oh, here's like the, you know, I can bold and I can do the outlining like you were saying. So there, there's no surprises on exam day. Like, oh, I didn't know the tool couldn't do this or could do that. That's what it's really designed for. Sure. Yeah, I see a question too. And I think I can speak a little bit about it. And then maybe Bill, you can add, mm-hmm. is AP Classroom set up the same way as Blue Book? And I would say it is similar, but 
no, it's, it's not the same, which I think is, it's why it's so important to have your students access that blue book preview before exam day. Right. So AP Classroom is still the tool you use for instruct classroom instruction, mm -hmm. for uh, practice exams, you know, through, you know, to uh, like all the great features you were, you were showing, like how showing student progress throughout the school year. That's what teachers should be using. The blue book previews are just to say, okay, now I want to know what a digital exam will look like. I want to know what those, you know, oh, what are those two panes that you talked about? How does that look like? What can I do? That's what it's there for. It's samples. It's not um, what I would consider like practice. Right. And what teachers normally consider practice to be, right? Yep. And then I saw a question too. Uh, I'm a first year AP teacher. What do you recommend as a, as a year one teacher uh, that I do to help my students prepare for the digital exam. And, and my best advice for that is uh, AP Classroom and AP Daily videos that are housed in, within AP Classroom are amazing. And there's so many additional resources in the AP community pages uh, for those. There's like handouts that go along with the AP Daily videos that are made by AP teachers and can really just guide your students um, you know, through the entire course and exam description from beginning to end, really, with the AP Daily videos uh, housed within AP Classroom. And then the AP Classroom questions can be applied right right along with those videos. So that would be my starting point as a first year teacher. All right. So I think we only have a minute left. If you could go to the next slide, that cb.org slash AP-2024-digital, dash dash that's a really important website to go to. It has a lot of in-depth information all about digital testing, AP exams, how to order the exam, technical details, um, how to you know download Blue Book. So I really encourage you to go there um, and, and review that material. Yeah, we've said this a couple of times, how important it is to download Blue Book and access those AP previews for all the reasons we just said. And then, yeah, post your questions on the teacher community. Have your coordinator post questions on the AP coordinator community about digital testing. We have a lot of educators on those communities and they're happy to answer and share their own experiences about it. Any, I don't know, closing comments from you, Melissa? <laughs> no, I, I just want to thank everyone for being here uh, and good luck this year in your classrooms. Bye for now. And uh, we'll hear more from us and in the upcoming months. Appreciate your time.